Tonight we're going to talk about shopping and the consumer economy with Dr. Benjamin Barber, the Reverend Billy, and Savitri D. And our moderator is Ian Masters. Um, the Hammer Forum, as you know, is a series of public discussions about current social and political issues. And it's made possible with the very generous support of Andy and Branya Galef. Our moderator is Ian Masters, who's going to introduce our guests. Um, Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of the radio program Back Background Briefing and the show Live from the Left Coast, which can be heard on Sundays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on KPFK. And he has a new rush hour program called Daily Briefing at 5 p.m. on Mondays through Thursdays. That's 90.7 FM. Um, Ian has also been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations. And he was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia, and, of all, and all of you for coming tonight to a public place that is free and dedicated to the community, not to commerce. As you all gird yourselves for the Christmas foray to the malls to sustain a way of life 70% dependent on shopping, you have no doubt heard that Americans got mixed reviews from the media in terms of their contributions to the consumer economy over the Thanksgiving holidays. As one who was born in a country founded by convicts as opposed to religious fanatics, <laughs> I feel privileged to have been adopted by this country. <laughs> and one of the best things about it is Thanksgiving, in part because this unique American holiday has not been taken over by Hallmark and made into another excuse for commerce and another obligation to consume. But that rare day of feasting with family may be numbered. Because according to the media, the lead story on the evening news last Thursday celebrated the brave souls, the true patriots, who abandoned hearth and home and family and camped out on the cold pavement outside the mall on Thanksgiving night to wait for the dawn's early light to give proof to a new holiday soon to be enshrined in the Hallmark Hall of Fame, Black Friday. Meanwhile, many did their patriotic duty to go to the mall as defined by George W. Bush after the 9-11 attack. And while they did go, they apparently did not spend as much money as they did last year and were more discriminating in what they bought, much of it already discounted. The good news, it seems, was that this little inconvenience known as a recession that has 20% of our countrymen out of work and one in eight Americans on food stamps, including one in four of our children, with one in six going to bed hungry, was not a big problem. What have we become? Are we the informed, active citizens Jefferson Adams and Franklin urge us to be? Or are we the passive consumers corporate America wants us to be? Since we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights like life and liberty, is the pursuit of happiness only possible with good credit and the compulsion to consume? Do we still have civic society, a public square, the commons, a sense of community, or are we all to be validated by what we wear, how much we spend, what we drive, and how many jet skis, RVs, SUVs, and ATVs we have in the driveway? Is there something more to being an American than spending money we don't have on credit we can't afford to buy things we don't need made in China that used to be made here to keep our Chinese creditors buying our treasury bills so that we can live beyond our means while we max out our grandchildren's credit cards? Or is there a kinder, gentler America, one in which people are judged by the content of their character, not the color of their money? Tonight, we will find out. I am joined by one of our guests, Dr. Benjamin Barber, who will be speaking soon. Ben? And, uh, Hello. <laughs> but, first, but first, we must uh, get off the stage to join you in the audience for a divine intervention, a religious experience. Ben and I will be back later, and then we'll have a discussion on stage before extensive Q&A from you, the audience. I so will return. Good. But now, ladies and gentlemen, 
from the tabernacle of Toys R Us, the ministry of Macy's, the sanctuary of Sam's Club, the wayside of Walmart, as a testament to Target, with the blessing of Best Buy, in the spirit of Starbucks, we bring you a holy and sanctified experience anointed by the chapel of consumerism, baptized by the church of the charge card, confirmed by the cathedral of capitalism. We, your humble servants, are soon to be graced by the presence of the preacher of profligacy, the minister of materialism, the shepherd of savings, the deacon of discounts, the pastor of possessions, the bishop of bargains, the cardinal of credit, the pope of prices, his holiest, that righteous rector of retail, the Reverend Billy! Yeah. Amen! Televangelist appreciates the wireless microphone. Praise <laughs> This is a beautiful church. A pink church. Hot pink. As Brother Ian was explaining to us, we're just on the outside cusp of a Black Friday weekend. It's a long weekend, and it's becoming longer. Amen, sister. My feelings precisely. Yesterday was Cyber Monday. In the years to come, let's hope that Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday and Friday are not added to this shopping orgy forced on Americans. We've been looking right at it for a while now. A number of us have. A number of us in this room have. I know for a fact I'm preaching to the choir today. That's a good thing. If you suddenly started singing in harmony, that would be great. By nothing day morning, This year, as in years past, we went to Macy's, to the front door of Macy's, at 5 a.m. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. 5 a.m. And we tried to hold back the consumer wildebeests. As we have in past years, we were swept back as we sang and preached, forced back the Ventura effect. When the wind is forced through a smaller aperture, it speeds up. More force shot through the front door at 5.01 by a big rampaging crowd, forced backwards, and finally, but you know what, this year, the Rockettes were on both sides. We shot into the middle of the Macy's, and, and the Rockettes were on both sides, kicking, amen, hallelujah. Now, that's, that's, the high, that's the high holy altar of consumerism, praise be. The Rockettes. And the people ran down the aisles, got their discounts. There's a feeling of hopelessness. You really have to find the hope in the hopelessness and cultivate that and leave the lessness away and just go for that hope. Because you're placing yourself in that kind of activism right oppositional to the heart of the compulsion, the, the physical, the psychophysical need for that discount for that flat screen TV at the back of the store. Buying the explanation that there's only a limited supply running down that aisle to get one of those last $149 Magnavoxes and rush it back to the front. We're done with our work at Macy's. 
by about 507, after we've been lifted by the elbows and escorted back out those doors, once again, coming the other way through the raquettes. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and deposited out front by these very kind of Blackwater Delta Force looking guys that Macy's are now hiring, amen. Not, not your average obese NYPD uh, uh, employee. This year, after Macy's, we got in a bus and we went out to Valley Stream, Long Island. We went to the the Walmart store where a year ago, exactly a year before, precisely that morning on Black Friday morning, Jimitai Damour was trampled. A Christmas temporary employee working for a minimum wage, uh, a young man, 19 years old, but a, a big young man, six foot five, 300 pounds with Rasta hair in the absence of professional security of any kind, he kind of gravitated to a sort of bouncer role and found himself in the center of the glassy front of the Walmart. The Walmart opened a year ago at 6 a.m. It was bitterly cold last year. And the people who wanted those discounted flat screen TVs were out in their SUVs idling, smoking grass, listening to music. And because of his, of his size, and probably because of his color, he became the de facto bouncer, and he was in the center of this glass front, when at about one minute to six, everyone jumped out of their cars and SUVs and started running right toward Jimitai. We parked at some distance away last Friday. The first thing that we had to, to behold, to register in our activist planning was that we were standing in the middle of the biggest parking lot we'd ever seen. There were thousands of cars and trucks, just as far as the eye could see, flooding out to the horizon, where you would see a little logo, a Best Buy way over there, a Home Depot way over there. Simply, simply a sea of car roofs. It stopped us in our tracks. We had one of those moments together in which the fact that this is permissible, that this is normalized, was being visited upon us and making it difficult for us to make a decision. How could some place so inhumane be called good? Be called as Brother Ian said, civil society. This many thousands of cars and trucks so that there's nothing else that you can see. Simply toxic. People will start dying in this environment. Does it come from what decisions? What kind of momentum forward? Who did this? Who said it was okay? We didn't know where to start. We wanted to make a memorial for Jimitai. And that was our idea. And there were about 15 of us. We're from all over the world. We're from all five boroughs. Many faith backgrounds, genders, ages, gathered together. We call ourselves the Life After Shopping Church. Amen. That's our faith. 
back away from the product, and something happens. We were having trouble imagining backing away from the product. We were immersed in a product. We were immersed in a sea, a dirty sea, of automobiles and trucks. We just started walking toward one of those logos, the Walmart logo. We told our choir master, James, I'll warm up the singers. Because we could see that they were starting to hesitate, starting to look down, starting not to feel so buoyant. It's a depressive environment. It stops you. It hypnotizes you. It does complicated things that we don't know what those things are. But we started feeling the psychophysical changes in us and started worrying, worrying about our activism, the possibility of a memorial, of a memorial. As we came closer to the Walmart, there it is, the homogenized paint job that we see all over the world, the flimsy front. And we see that there are basic elements here in this story. Around, around Jimitai's death place are many police. Company security people dressed in black and, and, and many police. A band surf from the base section said they, they look a little bit like the cars, immovable faces, dressed in black or dark blue, the fascist visors, the badges, armed, some of them on horseback. Looking out at all of us, at the sea of cars, with a kind of defensive ownership. Well, they own the scene of the tragedy. We're having some trouble putting this together. The people who have come for the Black Friday discounts, young couples mostly, people of all races, this is on the edge of Queens, young, young, young families, lots of kids, they're pinned against the wall with one of those movable fences that they use in demonstrations. Pinned against the wall, single file, all the way to the corner of the Walmart, amen. Way back there where the chaos starts, where the dumpsters start, where the unraveling insulation, you know, amen. Can you picture that, children? Are you with me? Hallelujah. So we had elements, we had, we had three elements welded together, and we couldn't see where our activism would take place. How could we stop shopping here? How could we have a memorial for Jim and Ty here? We have a sea of automobiles with that kind of meanness in the face, the pop-eyed look of the, of the automobile. Thousands of them. Then you've got a militarized tragedy and then you've got the, the consumers pinned to the wall, Mart. It's like a miniature 9-11. It's, it's, it's like the, 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 the people who might have been friends of the victims are the people who are now over-surveilled. Somehow, somehow we're guilty. There they are, pinned across. Savitri said, our director said, I think, I think we should get in line. That's what we did. We, went, we decided that that was the seam in the power that we had here. That was, the, that was the way in. As beaten up as these people seemed to be, that was the place here where there still might be a conversation. That was the place here where meaning might form. That was the place where we might have a memorial that was sincere. 
We got together in a circle down at the end of the line, <laughs> like two city blocks away. Amen. I started singing and praying a little bit together. And then moved slowly up the line, just talking to everybody. We had our little handouts with Jim Atai's picture, with the sweatshop and union busting information on the back about Walmart. Started vamping a little bit. Ooh, there's a life after Walmart, a life after Walmart, a life after Walmart, a life after Walmart. It's talking, talking over the fence, uh, handing the information over the fence. And they take, they take the picture of Jim Atai and yes, that was today, I remember. We started building testimonials of memory, softly murmuring, nothing dramatic, just kept our vamp going, our little steps moving slowly toward the dark mass before us. But gradually, having obviously some kind of defeat of that fence. And at one point, a policeman came over on his horse. He said, wait, we're just talking. We're talking about Jim Atai. You remember Jim Atai? Oh, yes, I do. We're here to honor him. We remember him. We got closer. We got closer. We got closer. We were moving up with the line. We got about 20 or 30 feet away from the, the first line of the police. And our director said, here. And then we brought out all the flowers that we'd gotten from dumpsters in previous nights. We'd done some serious floral dumpster diving, amen, praise be. And we brought out the flowers and the pictures of Jim Tai. And we made, we made our memorial and kept talking to the folks. They started moving the line really fast. We got the idea that maybe they wanted to fill up the store now and get the people that we had made our democracy with, get them into the products, out of this last commons place, out of this place where they're still able to talk with someone who might not agree with Walmart's policies. But as they came by, we had already talked to them and I stood at the fence like a preacher at the door after a sermon, shaking their hands. They all had Jim Atai's picture. And perhaps the company policy people, perhaps they, they wondered just a little bit as these people went into the big box holding Jim Atai's picture. And as we sang, and as we preached, We started feeling closer to Jim Atai's experience. Closer in the sense that we, we felt maybe that we were close enough now to learn from it. The violence of consumerism is hard to approach. It's hard to find it. The changes that we make in the consumer era, we don't have borders. We don't have a Berlin Wall. It's a pixelated fog. 
It's a commodified atmosphere. You don't have that kind of clarity. You're walking around usually confused inside some kind of police station. And we felt that we were close enough now, even just being as close as we dared to be to these people who were defending the death scene against the people who wanted to honor it. Amen, brother. We just at the end wanted to promise Jimatai that we would honor his memory by slowing down. First of all, slowing down were all of us opening the doors of that car. We're all of us sinners. We're all of us still consuming. And we're running towards some kind of glassy mirage. There are some, there's some kind of deal waiting for us behind that. And there are people in our way, and we don't see them. And they're working for nothing, and they have no rights, and they're vulnerable. And we will honor Jimatai, first of all, by slowing down, slowing down. We're not going to run anymore. We're not going to lunge for that product. We're going to slow down, and as we slow down, change what we see. If we slow down enough in that parking lot in Valley Stream, Long Island, we might not just save someone's life or not buy something made in a sweatshop or not bust a union or not down enough to realize that this is still Valley Stream. The earth is here. This is a wetlands. It is paved over. The stream is still there. The only authentic preacher right now is that stream. That stream around the world speaking to us about our consumption, about our militarism. In very specific ways, with tsunamis and fires and floods and extinctions and melting ice and the chaos of our beautiful physical world right now. We have to listen. We have to listen to that. We must stop our shopping. We must believe that we can. And it's going to start by doing little embarrassing things about things that we do in our home and things we do with our loved ones. We have to give gifts in a new kind of way this Christmas. We have to walk to that gift. We have to take a bicycle to that gift. We have to be strict with ourselves now and have a little discipline. We have, we have to be embarrassed enough. We have to be willing to change, children. Can we do that? Christmas is right here. Everybody in this room is going to give gifts. Give to the earth first. Give to the earth. Your loved one is the earth. You have the earth in you. Giving this Christmas needs to be the earth loving the earth. When we do that, we will honor Jim and Ty Damore. I ask for the radical creator, the wacky empresario. the master and mistress of beautiful evolution. May we do the right thing in giving this holiday season. Be with us when we make those decisions, when we stand in the aisle opposite a product.
Amen. Thank you. Where do I go now? Do I sit down here? You can sit down there if you like, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, spirits are moving me. Thank you, Reverend Billy. Now, let me introduce Dr. Benjamin Barber, who is a distinguished senior fellow at Demos and president of Civ World at Demos and the Walt Whitman Professor Emeritus at Rutgers University. Dr. Barber consults regularly with political and civic leaders in the United States and Europe, including former President Bill Clinton, Vice President Al Gore, Muammar Gaddafi, <laughs> and President Roman Herzog of Germany. He is the author of 17 books, including the international bestseller, Jihad versus McWorld. And his new book is Consumed, How Markets Corrupt Children, Infantilize Adults, and Swallow Citizens Whole. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Barber. Good evening, folks. I'm not going to take center stage, or you'll think of Reverend Billy and you won't hear me. Following him, I, I feel a little like uh, Immanuel Kant discussing religion after Martin Luther has been in church. I think we get from the Reverend Billy and the remarkable work he's been doing for many years a clear picture of a culture and society that is so permeated today by commerce, by commodification, by consumerism, by conspicuous consumption, and now more recently by financial crisis worldwide, that we know that we are in trouble. I don't think we need to do more than just listen to the wise words behind the Sermon on the Mall that we've had from Reverend Billy, to know that we are in a crisis. And if you don't know, the latest news should reassure you that the crisis is real. Dubai is bankrupt. When that happens, when that, when that happens, you know, you know there's trouble and very serious trouble. So I won't press that we have a problem. What I want to try to do, though, is put the problem in context. Uh, try to think a little bit about where that problem comes from and how intractable it is, why it's so difficult to follow Reverend Billy's simple, as every good moral prescription should be, simple prescription, just don't shop or shop less. But that's a prescription that is difficult to follow because we live in a culture whose fundamental logic insists that we shop and that our children shop and that we shop not just some for necessities and things we need but we shop all the time and everywhere and that is a mandate of economic logic that it's very very hard to oppose so much so that president obama who as a senator like so many of us pointed out the obscenity of President Bush after 9-11 saying, let's get back to doing what we do well to show the world that we are alive, let's get back to shopping. But now President Obama himself in the face of the crisis is saying, let's America get back to shopping, let's shop our way out of the recession, depression. And indeed, he's doing it in ways uh, with an economic team who are insisting that what some of us would see, Reverend Billy would certainly see, many of you would see as a new flavor of American society in which we are shopping less, using our credit cards less, and saving more. 
We've just been through a decade in which, for the first time in history, a national society had a negative saving rate, below zero. Spend more than we save, whereas most economists would say somewhere between 5 and 12 percent is what a nation ought to be saving if it's going to have a stable and continuous economy. We're not doing it. We started to save a little, and the litany we hear coming out of Washington today is stop it. Don't save. Start spending again. And it's not just us who are mandated to spend. President Bush said when he, at the end of his term, was in China, he said to the Chinese, stop being savers and become consumers like us. The idea is consume some of your own crap so you don't send it all to us. But in fact, what he was saying is what has been said everywhere, is that the modern global economy, whether it's presided over by a democracy or a tyrannical one-party communist state, depends on shopping. Now, I want to start this evening by suggesting to you that that actually is not capitalism, but a perversion of capitalism. The capital capitalist system was born in the 14th, 15th century out of the early modern period with a quite remarkable formula that did something that few systems have done, and this is why capitalism has been so successful. It yoked together selfishness and public spiritedness, altruism and serving yourself, because the formula, the capitalist formula said, if you look at the human community you're in, discover the real needs it has and provide a response to those needs, new goods, services, innovations, you can both serve the community and serve human need and make a profit doing it. And that was a way in which you could both serve the community and serve yourself. And the early Protestant ethic, remember Max Weber's great book, which most of us read in college about the rise of capitalism and the Protestant ethos, suggested how cannily the early capitalists and Protestants merged their two ideologies so that Puritan theology suggested that deferred gratification was a good thing and capitalism said you have to defer taking profits and reinvest. Capitalism called for hard work. Protestant theology said work is what God wants us to do. Serving others is a good thing, but in serving others you save yourself. There was this extraordinary intersection of Puritan Protestant theology and capitalism, which is why what became the greatest Protestant nation on earth also became the greatest capitalist nation on earth, and America in the 18th and 19th century was a powerfully Protestant nation whose Protestant values of hard work, saving, deferred investment, service to the community, both profoundly supported the growing productivity of a capitalist nation and at the same time comprised many of the values that we as Americans ch cherished. What has changed in the last 50 to 100 years has been the result not of capitalism's failure, but of capitalism's success. And I say that understanding that in many parts of the world, in many parts of our own country, there are many people still in need. Still, capitalism did for the middle classes in the West and in the United States, for what became a majority of citizens, provide for the needs and wants of the majority of Americans. And though we still have profound inequalities, and some of that productivity and some of that wealth was on the backs, first of slaves, and then an exploited working class, the fact is, nonetheless, that for, in the beginning of the 20th and middle of the 20th century, after World War II, for anybody who could say, I'm part of the American middle class, and by the way, 80 or 90 percent of Americans said they were, a lot of the rich say they're middle class, and even a lot of the poor say they're middle class, people had the feeling that they lived in an economic system that met their needs, and not just fundamental needs for clothing and shelter, but the need to have a home, to have transportation, to have a car, to have communications media, radio, and later a television. So I'm giving a fairly broad and generous definition of what a need or a want is, and capitalism did very well in producing those things. Indeed, it did so well that it came to a time after World War II 
when at least for the middle classes, it had so succeeded in providing for the needs of the middle class that the middle class needed to buy a lot less than capitalism needed to produce to stay in business. And that created the modern capitalist crisis, a crisis in which capitalism found itself still needing to produce and produce and produce and produce because that's how it creates wealth, that's how it makes profit, that's how it keeps going. And a middle class that was in effect saying, well, we don't need very much anymore. When I was growing up, after 10 or 15 years of collecting LPs, I had the music collection I needed. And I wanted to add a few things every year, but the basic music collection I had. So what was capitalism to do? How was it going to sell me music? And that was the beginning of a shift, because you know what it did. It changed the format. So in fact, by the 1970s, we went from actually from the 30s and 40s, when we were 78 records, we then went to 33 long play, vinyl discs, and then we started in popular music going to 45s, still another format, different machines required, and then in time to tapes, and of course nowadays to CDs. I have now recycled my same collection three or four times, as you have, and together we have kept capitalism afloat in the music industry. And this happens again and again because modern consumer capitalism is no longer engaged in trying to meet the real needs, manufacturing real goods to meet the real needs of ordinary people, but it is rather engaged in manufacturing needs to sell all the goods that it needs to sell to stay in business. And that's why since the 1930s and 1940s, it's no longer advertising that is the central feature of modern capitalism. Advertising at its best was a way of telling you what was for sale, why one product was better than another, value, quality, and price. Advertising is a useful way of finding out what's out there and which brand we could buy. From advertising, however, we've moved to marketing. Don't confuse marketing and advertising. Advertising is telling you about the products that are there. Marketing is to get you interested in products you never heard of, don't need, and probably don't want either. And what we market is not products, but brands. And the point of marketing brands is that if we can sell you on the brand, it doesn't matter whether the products being sold under the brand are necessary to you. You're wedded to the brand. Saatchi, the great uh, British marketing expert tells a wonderful story, he tells it uncritically about marketing. He says, the ideal brand identity I myself can tell you about, he said, I'm a great fan of head and shoulders. It's just a great way to wash your hair. And he said, I've been using it now for 25 years. For the first 10 years, it was particularly useful to me. But the real success of the brand is I've continued to use it for the next 15 years after those first 10 years, because after 10 years, I went completely bald. <laughs> but I continued to use it. Now, that's the ideal brand, a brand you literally keep using whether or not you need the products in it. And that's a great way to maintain a capitalist economy where you continue to produce things that people don't need. Now, I just give you a few examples of the sorts of things uh, I am I'm talking, uh, I'm, I'm talking about here because we face everywhere these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of things. And by the way, the other side of this is there are still real needs. There are people who have needs around the world. But the people who have the needs don't have the dough. And the people who have the dough don't have the needs. And capitalism has a choice. It can market and sell and invent goods for people with real needs and figure out somehow a way to get paid. Or it can go the easier route of selling needs it manufactures to people who do have the dough. And as you know, it's chosen the latter route. But let me give you some examples and what the contrary might be. Take the drug field. There is a deep need for retroviral, inexpensive, generic drugs around the world, and some companies are doing a little with that. But how much easier for the drug companies to make something like Botox, a poison, and then convince in the multi-billion dollar cosmetic industry, convince Americans that what they really need is frozen faces so they can stay young for other, other forever, and let's have a marketing 
campaign about youth and the beauty of youth and getting old is bad, and so freeze your face with Botox and you can stay young forever. So we end up with an industry, a pharmaceutical industry, that makes more money off cosmetic goods than it does off of generic drugs, which are genuinely needed, but where people can't really sell them. Nowadays, Pizza Hut has a new pizza. I'm going to assume that pizza itself is a need. I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> but they now make a 2,000 calorie pizza. And they advertise it as, you know, this super, super pizza. 2,000 calories sold to a nation of obese people. 40 or 50 percent of Americans are obese. This is the first nation in history whose children are both obese and malnourished at the same time as a result of the diets. It's quite, I mean, technically malnourished and technically obese. But here are these 2,000 calorie pizzas. Meanwhile, some innovative companies have developed a plumpy nut paste that can be used in developing countries, which has 500 calories in a small bar that can be manufactured for a nickel and distributed easily that can do a lot to meet the nutritional needs of poor kids, and that's most kids in the developing world. But now compare how much is being made from 2,000 calorie pizza that makes us just a little bit fatter and 500 calorie plumpy nut paste that can help solve the problem of nutrition. And again, you see this imbalance of modern capitalism or in the electronics area. Again, I'm not gonna argue about cell phones. They have a use, they, they're good, fine. But let's take the iPhone. What is the iPhone? It's a bad camera. It's a bad browser. It's a not very good telephone that doesn't have a very long life. The new one's a little better than the old one. It does a number of things badly. And the people who want it or say they need it before it was put on the market had no idea that they needed it. I actually followed the discussion on the internet under the uh, site where the iPhone was being advertised. And if you look back at that, you'll see young people writing in from all over the world saying, I hear there's this great, cool product. I really need it. Will someone tell me exactly what it is? <laughs> On the other hand, computer companies have developed very, very inexpensive computers, $50, $100 laptops which can play a vital role in education around the world. And there are some programs where these $50 and $100 computers are being sold in places like Libya, where I really am a consultant, and where they're trying to provide these $50 computers for every child in school to do a jump start on education. So there again is a computer industry that on the one hand could provide for real needs in parts of the world that can't afford, however, to buy things very well, or can figure out the latest gadget they can sell to people who have the money. And again, what capitalism has done is make the choice to sell not what is needed, but what can be sold if you manufacture needs for them. Or my last example of that, These are, what are these, about two bucks a shot now, 250 a shot. The water in 60% of the bottled water, I'm not talking about boutique water, Pellegrino and that sort of stuff. I'm just talking about this bottled water you get, comes from the same ground wells and groundwater in Texas and Wisconsin and New England that we get in our taps and through the aquifers. But the difference is, rather than getting it through a public utility that has long ago been bought with, built with public funds, with free water, we're now buying our water at $2 a shot in plastic bottles that can't be easily recycled and that have to, because of the transportation needs, leave behind a large carbon imprint every time you buy one of these. $25 billion a year in bottled water we Americans are spending. I'm not talking now about Uganda, where bottled water may be the only safe kind of water you drink, but nobody can afford $2 a bottle, so they're not gonna get it. Why not, instead of spending 
$25 billion on something we don't need. And by the way, if you like drinking out of a bottle, get a glass one, carry it around, fill it up in your tap every morning and carry it around with you. You'll have a nice bottle of water with you everywhere you go. What might we do instead? A small company in Denmark developed an extraordinary new innovation. That's what capitalism is supposed to do, innovate and provide real needs. They looked at the water situation in the world and said, gee, three billion people around the world don't have water to drink, even clean enough to clean their clothes with, let alone to drink every year. What can we do about that? And they innovated. This is not it, but it's a kind of model just to show you what it is. This little company came up with what they called a life straw. The life straw has nine filters in it. And those nine filters will filter out almost every contaminant from arsenic to germs to heavy metals that are found in bad water around the world and make any groundwater safe to drink. And this straw will last about a year and a half and can be bought for about a buck and a half. Now that's capitalism. That's how capitalism, and by the way, the little Danish company doing it is doing very well. They're making a nice profit, as well they should. That's how capitalism is supposed to work. But on the whole, this is where capitalism is, not here. And that's what's gone wrong with modern capitalism. And just let me make a couple of remarks, and then we'll get to our discussion so we can all get involved in this this debate about what this new kind of capitalism has to do to market to us brands and things that we don't really need. It needs to do something to us as consumers. First of all, it has to infantilize us. It has to give us impulsive taste of a child, which means it has to create goods that we buy not because we need them, but because impulsively we want them. It wants adult consumers to act like children who say, gimme, 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 I want, I want, I want. And we see this in every market, particularly the entertainment market, where the primary movies being made today, not just for the US, but around the world, are cartoons or comic book films. And again, I have no problem. That's fine to have some comic book films and some cartoons. But that's all we have. 95% of the tickets sold around the world go to Spider-Man, Shrek, cartoons. Some of them are clever. Some of them are not. But the point is, that's all there is. They force everything else off the market. We are infantilizing adults and trying to get them to buy like children impulsively because they feel like it. 10 million Americans today have formally declared themselves, I kid you not, shopaholics. And they go to clinics where they get treated, sometimes in 12-step programs. And I think that's actually an honest and good reaction because the shopaholic is someone who goes to shop, goes to the mall with no shopping list, with nothing in mind to buy because they feel the need to shop. Why did you go? I was depressed. Why did you go? I had a fight with my lover. Why did you go? I was mad. Why did you go? I was tired. I wanted to do something. I'd seen the movie. That's shopaholism. And it's a serious American pathology. There is a debate going on right now in the American Medical Association as to whether actually to declare it a serious disease. So this isn't just something, you know, critics like me make up to make a point. It is a real issue. So infantilization, the infantilization of adults is one part. But a second part is if you want to sell an awful lot of crap that nobody will buy, then you've got to expand the consumer market, which means sell to teenagers, sell to tweens, sell to kids, sell to infants, to two-year-olds, to one-year-olds. Psychologists have discovered that one-year-olds, before they learn to speak, can recognize and identify brand logos. And you know, that's a joke for us, but in fact, the marketers say, wow, let's start using TV advertising on things like Baby TV and Baby Einstein and so on. Let's start getting logos to them, not to sell them anything yet, but to get the brand logos in their heads so that later on they will become loyal brand subscribers to whatever it is we're going to sell under the brand. And who knows in five or 10 years what that might be. Coke may be making films. Fox might be making soda, doesn't matter. If you're loyal to the brand, you will do it. So infantilize the adults and sell to the kids younger and younger and younger. And one of the things I did when I wrote Consumed is read a whole series of marketing texts that are being used now around the country in the business schools where 
young MBAs and people getting business degrees are coming, and they all specialize in targeting children. And they talk about the need, for example, to get rid of the gatekeepers if you want to target children. When I first read this, I said, the gatekeepers? You know, maybe this is something from Reverend Billy, some of the pearly gates. Well, the gatekeepers are the way the marketers talk about parents. They stand in front of their children, protecting them from the targeting by marketers. So one of the big strategies that every marketing firm is engaged in is how to, in effect, get the gatekeepers out of the way so they can get at the children. And if you go to the mall, you'll see one of the devices. The things, the places, the stores that sell to children are one level, one section, quite separate from the places that sell to young adults, quite separate from those that sold to old adults. The last thing you want in a mall is a family that shops together. Because a family that shops together doesn't shop very much. Because they act as brakes on one another, they're thinking about the community. So divide them up. Get grandma in one place, get mom in another, get the teens somewhere else, and get the little kitties somewhere else atomizing and dividing the American family, which the right has been complaining about for a long time, but the left doesn't seem to recognize that commercial capitalism is directly involved in the atomization, the disintegration of the American family as a condition of continuing to sell all that needs to be sold in order to keep capitalism in business. So that too, when Reverend Billy says, don't shop, you know, the first the first protection, the first level of protection is parents protecting their kids from marketers. But the marketers have their own campaigns. We're sending 30,000 more troops to Afghanistan, the president said tonight. But the marketers are sending hundreds of thousands of troops into the war on children to get not just the parents out of the way, but to get the reverends and the teachers and the professors and anybody else who is trying to protect kids from that sort of targeting. There's all this worry about sexual exploiters and what are we gonna do with the people who are sexual abusers, child abusers, pedophiles who get out of prison, you know, put a label on them. We ought to be labeling our marketers as pedophiles, people abusing our children, but we don't, we celebrate them and we send our own children to get MBAs in that science and go on to do it. One of the marketing campaigns I went to when I was writing Consumed, there was a lovely young woman, eight months pregnant, addressing a marketing convention, hundreds of people at the convention. And she was talking oblivious to her own beautiful bulging, bulging belly about how can we get to the kids, the little ones? How can we push the gatekeepers aside? And this was, again, she was, she's a lovely lady and she'll have a love, she, by now she has a lovely kid or two. But that separation, which makes us think, yes, but capital, we've got to continue to sell. We've got to make it work. So we infantilize the adults, we target the kids, and then, this is probably the most important thing we do, we privatize the society, and both Ian and Reverend Billy talked about this. The assault on public space that is 50 years old and that started with the re-emergent of the Austrian school of neoliberal economics that says the market can do everything, government can do nothing, the Thatcher-Reagan ideology that makes war on government, war on democratic institutions and says leave it to the market, is ultimately an attack on the public and what it means to be a public and suggests that we need to privatize our nation that it is enough for citizens to be consumers of politics, consumers of religion, to exist comfortably and in freedom. Freedom is private, which means the consumer is all you have to be to protect your freedom. And that ideology now permeates Democrats and Republicans, and now it's moved over to Europe, and it permeates the European mentality as well. So that when anyone talks about public, it's a swear word. President Obama has abandoned public option in health because every time he mentions the term, someone calls him either a communist or a fascist for doing that. And yet all he's doing is talking about this wonderful old English word from the Latin, public. Our word republic comes from the public, the res publica, the things of the public. 
that belong to all of us together. And all public option says is that our health as a community belongs to all of us. Our right to have health care belongs to all of us. Let's make sure there is at least a public option. If we're not going to have a single server, single payer health system where we all get Medicare, let's at least be sure that's an option. And basically, the Democratic Party can't even fight for that option because we have so demonized the idea of being a public. And if you demonized being a public, then you demonize being a citizen. And you say that all the consumer has to do is consume the politicians. And of course, the politicians become commodities and they buy their offices with money and they hire marketing experts who market them to the consuming public. And even as good a president who, with whom I worked as Bill Clinton, talks hideously and continues to talk about how he was hired to do a job. And now Obama has been hired, and these people better do their jobs. We do not hire our politicians. We elect them as fellow citizens who carry with us the civic burden for our public goods. And to talk about hiring politicians is an obscenity that we ourselves, our best politicians, engage in. So this notion of privatizing the public sphere has gone all the way down in American politics, right to the point where in many of our suburban areas where half the country lives, there is no public square anymore. I lived in Piscataway, New Jersey, when I was in teaching at Rutgers University. And friends would come from New York and elsewhere and from abroad and say, oh, can we go downtown? Let's, I want to see Piscataway. It sounds like a great old town. It was founded in 1656. It was by the Piscataway. Uh, Indians. And I sadly had to say, well, actually, there's nowhere to go. There is no downtown. Piscataway had a town hall and a police station as part of a corporate park. It has a couple of big box malls and a series of strip malls. It has some business, but quite literally, there are no public spaces, no sidewalks, no places to ride bicycles, no places to create a community in Piscataway. The old notion of America, the village square, what's around it? A church, a theater, a city hall, a school, and some shops has given way to the large big box mall, which is retail, 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 shop, 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 and nothing else. And that goes to the reality of what the problem has become. There's nothing wrong with shopping. We all have to shop. We have to buy things to live. What's wrong is shopping all the time. Nothing wrong with commerce, the exchange of goods for cash. But commerce everywhere, commercializing everything, is a disaster. We rightly fought a long, hard, cold war against a totalitarian system. What is totalitarianism? It's when politics is everywhere. Even had the Soviet Union lived up to its socialist ideals, totalitarianism was a bad idea because it says everything's political. Religion's political, culture's political, art's political. Everything is politicized. And we rightly said that's a totalization of life, which we call totalitarian. We don't like theocracy today because when religion takes over everything, takes over politics, takes over art, takes over every aspect of life, that's theocracy. But when commerce takes over everything, all the advertising space, 24-7 shopping everywhere, nothing but the logos of commercial firms everywhere, ubiquitously, we call it liberty. Well, for me, commercial totalitarianism is as dangerous and destructive of our natural pluralism and diversity as theocracy or political totalitarianism, and that's what we don't get and we don't see anymore. And it's a kind of coercion, but it's a different kind of coercion than we're used to because it's bottom-up coercion. We've learned for a thousand years to see coercion as something that comes from the state, from above. America was settled by people who distrusted political power, even democratic power. De Tocqueville told us that even majoritarianism could be abused. The tyranny of the majority he talked about, and that's true. We distrusted power. Every time we saw political power, we said, divide it, contain it, bill of rights, separation of powers. 
So we got used to thinking that the coercion that we face comes top down, and we Americans still believe that. We still think government's the danger, and today Republicans and Democrats alike say too much government, big problem. But the reality is coercion today comes not top down from what is actually a fairly weak, unthreatening state and democratic institutions. It's coming bottom up from the invisible coercion of markets. And it's a much more dangerous coercion because we can found it with liberty. We think we're shopping, we're being free. It's what a potato chain said in the 1980s that sold only baked potatoes in various forms. But their advertising said, we at the potato chain give you liberty. We give you the choice of toppings. And so much of what happens in America is about the choice of toppings. You come here to LA as a visitor like me and you go to Hertz to pick up a car, you can rent any kind of car you want from a Prius to a Hummer to a Maserati, anything you want. What freedom? The one choice you don't have is public transportation. But that's the real choice. That's the fundamental choice by which our real lives are guided. Almost all of the choices we have in America are about the toppings on potato or what kind of toothpaste or what kind of car, not the fundamental public choices because we privatize choice and we think private choice is about liberty when in fact public choice is what real freedom is about. That's why so often we make choices that we think are just private which have public and social consequences that we don't measure. You buy that Hummer, you buy that 60 mile an hour, uh, 16 gallons uh, per mile, whatever, the car that doesn't get good mileage, and you say, well, but I like it, it drives fast, I don't worry about it, and you actually are choosing invisibly to support the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. Because you are saying, I am choosing through my private choice for an expensive car to depend on imported oil. So the choice of what kind of car you buy is inadvertently a public choice for war, a public choice to go to war. The choice to shop at Walmart and get cheap prices and a variety of goods that no local retailer can give you in a town is also a choice to abuse workers, but more importantly, to destroy the towns of America because the small retail shops that are the heart of downtown America cannot compete with the pricing and the variety of goods you get in Walmart. So the choice, the seeming choice, I'm just, I just wanted a cheap good. A lot of people, I've heard people in the working class and union people say, yeah, you know, I defend Walmart, particularly now that they're greener and that they're doing a little better by their workers and so on. They're giving us choices we need, cheap goods and a broader variety. But it's a choice whose, the economists call it wonderfully, externalities. The externality, the public consequence we don't see of the choice to shop at, mall, at Walmart is the destruction of our villages and downtown retail centers, which is the destruction of the values and the fabric of American social life. But we don't see that as part of the choice. And what happens there is a kind of powerful coercion, but we don't feel it. And let me just end by telling you a story of a wonderful African monkey trap, the way they get monkeys in certain tribes in Africa, because it reminds me so much of American capitalism today. The African monkey trap works this way. You make a box, yay ho, of this size, foot by foot by a foot, solid wood. You drill a small hole in it about this size, and you put a large, luscious nut inside the box. And the hole is geared to the wrist of a monkey so that a monkey can reach in and take the nut, like that, and then it tries to withdraw. Now it can't get out as long as its fist is gripped holding the nut. Now all it has to do to be free is let go of the nut. But hunters again and again and again will find the monkey still grasping the nut, but pulling and pulling and pulling. And sometimes they even find the monkey dead, rigor mortis has set in, still holding on to the nut. Now, is the monkey free or coerced? So like the American shopper who holds on to the good, 
goods, the needs, the wants that have been manufactured, who won't let go and is in effect gripping the chains that manacle him. But the manufacturers and producers and marketers say, we're not doing anything. All he has to do is let go. If he doesn't want what we provide for him, don't buy it. The good manufacturer loves Revlon, but right, don't shop. You don't want what we buy, don't shop. Nobody's forcing you, no guns to your head. But what they have learned is that man is part monkey, whether or not the creationists like it. We hold on ourselves, infantilized, targeted by marketers, loving things that we don't know what they are. We won't let go. And on the one hand, all we have to do to be free is to let go, but we face a society, a culture, a marketing industry, and a capitalism that can't afford for us to let go and still stay in business. That's the quandary we face. It's a deep quandary. It's a quandary which, yes, it only takes letting go, stopping shopping, but understand that what we are against is the logic of a vast system. And that's a system that won't be changed without political struggle, as well as economic and cultural struggle. Thank you very much. So you've all met the Reverend Billy and minus the Life After Shopping Gospel Choir. Sadly. Um, you haven't met Savitri, who is the director of the Life After Shopping Church, which is a radical performance community based in New York, including a 40-voice choir conducting political actions inside big boxes and chain stores. They stage concerts and shows called Fabulous Workshops, which have taken them to four continents to resist consumerism. And we'll just run a five-minute clip of a, a feature-length movie featuring them called uh, What Would Jesus Buy? And then I think we'll forego the discussion because we're way behind uh, and get straight to Q&A. So let's just look at this film. As I mentioned, we've run, pretty much run out of time for a discussion. And I know you all, and this is a public event, this is a free, open public forum uh, dedicated to community, not to commerce. So uh, let's take some questions. I'm sure we have them. We have microphones on both sides. Amen. And let's take a question here from this gentleman here in... Uh, well, actually, the lady there, you've just passed her on the, on the corner. Straight ahead. There you go. <laughs> that lady has a deep voice. Oh, I see. Okay, well. That's no, okay. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, question for Reverend Billy. You just ran for mayor in New York City, and I was kind of curious. The other people were talking about how our politics has become a commerce thing as well. So was your response that you were receiving retail politicking, the same you're experiencing when you're doing your other activism? Yes, the Green Party uh, approached Savitri and myself last winter. Uh, we knew that Mike Bloomberg would be spending $100 million then. <laughs> and we thought, well, here's consumerism in human form. And um, we thought that many of our issues would be engaged by opposing this impossibly rich person who was electronically wallpapering our branding, Dr. Barber branding our city with his image. And it, you know, it was, Savarchi, can you say something about it? Sure, I, I think it really speaks to Dr. Barber's point about the, the weakness of politics actually more than anything else because what we found is that we had a, practically no agency in that, um, in that role and that the work we do as activists and artists is, is much more powerful, has a lot more traction in the culture than uh, stepping into this very prescribed, very regimented, and truly industrialized position of politician, which didn't suit Billy all that well. 
I should say. <laughs> I mean, you have to want that job, but um, uh, I think it was, uh, it, it was instructive. And, and I think everyone should run for office because it teaches you really uh, why so many politicians are the way they are. It is a, it is a mechanized process. A question on this side. Do we have anybody? Yes. I am there. Uh, you didn't talk about the military complex consumerism. A, a kind of, a, I guess, in a, a consumer equivalent of the military industrial complex? Is that the, was that the question? I think the consumerism and militarism are in a, uh, they're, they're two sides of the same thing. Um, Dr. Barber, can you speak to this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most, the most powerful linkage has to do with the privatization of the military. If you think about public things, the rest public in this country, national defense, national security are among the few that most people would say you just can't privatize. That has to be a citizen duty. We all have to be involved, and yet we have just done that. You know, there are actually currently more private uh, uh, entrepreneurial soldiers in Iraq than there are, despite the over 100,000 who are still there, public soldiers. We have outsourced the perimeter security in most American deface, defense bases is done by outsourcing it to private firms. So quite literally, you're no longer a sentry on a place like Fort Hood. You no longer do sentry duty. It's done by outsourcing. So we've also privatized this most precious notion of the citizen soldier and instead we basically mm -hmm. it's not just that we pay mercenaries we pay the poor in our society to join the army we do that too that's a kind of privatization but more importantly we actually hire private security firms to uh, do things and by the way it raises all sorts of fundamental problems because what happens when a private military person at blackwater commits a crime it's a U.S. soldier. It's very clear how that's handled. But what do you do? Uh, does the local country uh, handle it? Does the U.S. military handle it? Well, uh, how do you do? It? So that privatization of the military is extraordinarily dangerous to our democracy. As well, I think uh, our our ability to resist militarism is hampered by consumerism and, and the commodified culture we live in, largely because of this question of public space not having any place in which we could resist a war at this point. And, and I recommend that you come to the next Hammer Forum, which we're doing on uh, the privatization of national security and the whole issue of mercenaries. And uh, that will be on January 12th. On the January the 12th. I think I wanted to address the idea that um, the military uh, complex is so wasteful also, just like over shopping is wasteful because we're using resources you know, from the world, from the rest of the world that could use it properly. Of course, and harder on the environment than anything any of us can ever think of. Nothing's harder on the environment than a war. Mm -hmm. Question on this side, this gentleman here in the... Yeah. Well, one comment on no, no, wait, 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 you're getting a microphone. Oh, here we go. Yeah, well, one comment on that. They have military conventions, sales conventions, and they love to sell weapons all over the world. So uh, that's another marketing thing. They have Walmart right. of weapons. But I'd like to ask the question to all the audience. How many of you will stop buying China today? I ask you to do that. I've made that my practice. If it's made by a slave child <laughs> in a country that you can't even see one block and they had to wear respirators at the uh, Olympics, maybe you ought to stop by in there. And that's your challenge. And thank you Amen. for bringing it up. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. Let me, let me just show you how hard it is to do that. Though, you see, you want to shop American, you're going to buy a Chevrolet, you're going to buy a Toyota. Toyotas are made from 70% American parts, wholly manufactured in South Carolina plants. Chevrolets are manufactured nowadays 80% in Mexico with 60% foreign parts. So, so well, you that's, but you're driving a Japanese car by brand. So you see, it's very, you can't just buy American. We live in an interdependent, globalized world where those distinctions simply don't allow us uh, to act in the kind of rational way that you rightly see. And again, I'm not trying to discourage you, I'm just trying to say it's complicated, it's hard, and that's the way they want it to be because it makes it much harder to stop shopping mm -hmm. or to shop American. I get red wing shoes, made in America, hey. I get All right, Minnesota. Made in America by union people. Amen. Let's uh, take, a, take another question here. This lady here. Amen. In, uh, <laughs> Got a preacher here. Uh, enough enough uh, from the 
yeah. few years ago, I needed a refrigerator. I just moved here from the Bay Area, and I was really horrified that LA apartments don't come with refrigerators. You have to buy a refrigerator oh, and put your own refrigerator in, in the apartment, at least the one that I got near UCLA. And so I put an ad on Craigslist saying, I want a free refrigerator. Somebody give me <laughs> your refrigerator. And within a week, somebody emailed me saying, take my refrigerator, I'm getting a new one. And Hallelujah. Can take it. Let me guess, now it's your business. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Now you no, sell used refrigerators. <laughs> I mean, it, it didn't last very long, but then the city of LA was giving away energy efficient refrigerators if your refrigerator was over 12 years old, which mine was because it was that old. But anyway, the point is now whenever I have something that is perfectly good, but I don't actually want it or need it, like a piece of furniture that somebody's left behind, I always put an ad in the free section of Craigslist saying, this is the thing, this is where you can come and get it, just email me. and within hours, people email me to pick up free stuff. So I encourage everybody to give away stuff right. that they don't need. Those networks exist in every town in this country now. I think there's a gift economy revolution going on secretly. In uh, the United States right now, so many of us have s so much less cash. Uh, we're getting emails every day from people who are saying that, um, well, I've just opened up my garage and I'm putting stuff out there from my storage unit I forgot I had. Uh, all sorts of thrift and barter and swap a and skill swapping and um, um, neighbors are meeting each other and getting to know each other a little bit right now because uh, we have more time, we're underemployed. We're getting emails from people that are, that, um, are grateful for, for some of the change that has been forced on them by the Great Recession, but are making the adjustments, are finding, are finding themselves creating these, these economies that are really off the books, you know, and um, not registering with the Fox Business News with their right. graphs and their... And that's the ingenious uh, potential of capitalism that he mm -hmm. was talking about, exactly. Behind you, there's a gentleman with his hand up. To have a public forum, to have a public discussion, we have to have some contact, we have to like each other or love each other, but right now we don't seem to love each other anymore, there's too much hate going and uh, we seem to be pushed to hate each other. What do you think about that? We have a media whose historic mission was to educate, civilize, find common ground, but which because today it's defined not by its civic, but by its private mission, its corporate mission to make money, finds it makes a lot more sense to sell polarization. So all the networks find that that actually sells better. Years ago, I, I saw it coming. I was on a uh, program with a Reagan education secretary. This was before Bill Bennett was there debating education. And to my surprise, as we debated on Channel uh, 13 in New York, we found actually we had a fair amount in common because we both in our own ways believed in public education. Uh, he from a conservative point, me from a leftist point, and we had a very, very good and productive discussion. At the end, the director came out and said, that was an absolutely terrific discussion you had. You found so much to agree on. Now could we do it over again, and would you disagree with one another? Because what you just did is lousy television. This was public television. <laughs> that said that wow. to me. And this is, you know, I mean, the media, the me, what sells, I mean, you see, you don't have, you know that, Tiger Woods sells, Copenhagen is in a week. That's We're right. going to Copenhagen with no formula to stave off what is going to be global warming, but all you hear on television is, you know, the, the, the four murders of the four cops, the tragic, unhappy thing that happened, but it's not worth days and days of television. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods, what happened to him? What's that about? Does he have a mistress? Doesn't he have a mistress? Did his wife try to club him or get him out of the car with the club? <laughs> you know, I mean, that, but, but, you know, that's what the meat, but that make, they'll say, I'm sorry, but that's what the American people want. That's always what they will say. Don't blame us. Americans want that. If we put the other stuff on, the serious news channels that have a civic mission, nobody watches. Put the crap on, everybody watches. Mm. They love it. Your fault, not ours, they say. You have another question here in the center? Yes. Don't you think that, that this problem may start with teaching our children 
and maybe focusing on some of the intangibles that we've lost, like innovation, um, compassion, productivity, imagination, that lead children to not be buyers but be creators? Well, of course, um, but I think you remove, we remove ourselves from that equation when we say that in a way. I think it's, we, we have to treat ourselves like children too at this point. And, and uh, it's very easy in this country for people to distance themselves from these, from these issues, these problems, things that other people do, things that other people do, shoppers do. Those people, um, it, it's important that we all re, uh, reinvest in those ideas in our everyday life right now. I mean, that's the solution to the isolation that leads to the hatred. If we all invest in our own imaginations, turn our back on marketing and advertising, return to each other our own practical wisdom, our own knowledge base, thousands of years of knowledge and, and understanding, abandoned for shopping. Um, we have to do this before we can do it for our children. And the other thing is, of course, commerce doesn't stop at the walls and doors of our educational institutions any more than it stops anywhere else. Our colleges and universities are becoming wholly owned subsidiaries of the big corporations, not just the medical and corporate research they do where they no longer allow the research to be published in the public sector, but it's private, it's patented, and so on. But where, for example, at Rutgers University, when I was teaching there, we became a Coca-Cola school, which meant right. Coke gave $10 million for a 20-year contract that meant not only was Coke advertising everywhere, but the only drinks and food that could be sold on this campus where we were teaching people about independent critical choice was Coca-Cola products. And I later went to Maryland, which was a Pepsi-Cola school, and I had to change, <laughs> change my taste the other way. It's a joke, but it's more serious than this. There was a school you might have read about in South Carolina a couple years ago where Coca-Cola gave like a thousand bucks for a scholarship, and mm -hmm. return for that had Every semester, a Coca-Cola day, where the marketers came in and marketed their stuff to the kids, these sweet drinks that you know, make them obese and malnourished at the same time. Well, one kid came that day with a Pepsi t-shirt to Coca-Cola day. Great, right, a little rebel? He was suspended from school by the principal. <laughs> suspended, and his getting into college was put in danger by doing that. I thought of that when I saw you, you know, getting yourself arrested at Disneyland. Here's a kid who, in effect, his educational career is compromised because he makes the daring statement of wearing a Pepsi shirt on Coca-Cola Day at his high school. So these are serious things. Last thing to say, education, we always think education, the schools, universities, and so on. But of course, that's not where the kids are being educated anymore. You know, this is where they're being educated. TV, big screens, little screens. Reverend Billy talked about the pixelated culture we live in. It's the pixels they're learning from. When I was teaching in college, I had the kids three, four hours a week, 30 weeks a year. If you're teaching in an elementary school, maybe you have them five hours, four hours a day for about 32 weeks a year. But the guys who control the media, the films, the advertising, right, they've got them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. That's where the kids are being educated, and we are no competition, even if we had the loving, wonderful places that you talk about where we could really do the job we ought to be doing. We're not doing it. Even if we made the universities and schools a no-go zone. For <laughs> Leave us some hope, Dr. Barber. Leave really, us some hope. Honestly, yes. I do yes. think we can foster, oh we can God. foster politics. resistance. There must be a way we out of hope. The way is politics. Every day, we do. Politics, politics, politics. <laughs> you can't just do it as consumers. You can't just do no. it by fixing the schools. We need a political movement. That's we do. The point. It's about well, let, let, let's, let's focus on that then, because you gave such a, a, a thorough, uh, 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 no, I was going to say thoroughly depressing uh, analysis. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but entertaining. An accurate, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but rather bleak picture. Uh, so it seems to me the dichotomy here is we have a choice. Either we're passive consumers or active citizens. How do you reinvent citizenship? Do you start from the schools? Do you teach civics? How do you, uh, I, it seems to me that the system that you uh, so described so well, Ben, is coming up against a brick wall because the, you, Henry Ford at least understood you had to pay your workers enough to buy your product. Uh, we're creating a generation of the most sophisticated consumers on earth, but they don't have the purchasing powers. The kids are demonstrating now against the UC uh, fees going up 32%. They're taking on huge, huge uh, de debt, uh, and the job prospects are nil. So Wall Street's been rescued, Main Street hasn't. There, uh, 
I get a feeling that we're up against a brick wall, and that the the uh, is is that is that a, is that a sort of Pavlovian position we're in? Will there be some hope in in the uh, in what looks like capitalism having lost its way in the extent to which uh, people simply won't have purchasing power to continue this con inexorable consumption that you've described? I don't think so, because I think the human spirit is much more powerful than the human body. And I Amen. think Reverend Billy, you know, is in his own way making that very, very clear, that the spirit can be powerful, but we need people who animate it. Obama, as a candidate, animated the spirit of a lot of young people yes. who were cynical about politics. Unfortunately, once he was president, it was business as usual, and a lot of the kids went back to their business as usual, and we haven't seen too many of them since then. But he showed that it was, that it was possible. The Green Movement has gotten a lot of people here, I know, or you know, even the recycle. Who would have thought 15 years ago most people would be recycling stuff and sorting stuff without the support of their own communities? I mean, the fact is, we have a deep inclination and need, a real need, not a manufactured need, for the things you're talking about, whether it's prayer or love or recreation or family or community. And the guys who are trying to sell us stuff we don't need are actually up against the very, they're the ones mm. who have the tough sell, not Amen. us. Mm. If we're right. willing to do the politics and the movement work that will take advantage of the spirit that's Well, there. and to be truly independent. And do we even know what that looks like? I don't think we have to reinvent citizenship. Let's just be citizens. I mean, it, it, citizenship doesn't, there's we'll no, rediscover, perhaps, there's no yeah. better yeah. idea than that yet, so. Right. Amen. Amen. But I do think we have to be willing to fall through space right now and, 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 and work for change without uh, necessarily a, a perfect solutions Just in, in mind. in front here, there's uh, in the middle. Good here, night, folks. Don't, don't shop now. Be careful yeah. out there. Be careful yeah. out there. The advertising One, two, three, will be waiting four, for you right at the door. Don't drive and text. Okay. Uh, what, what, what would a left-wing populism look like? Or, I, mean, I mean, I think we're there's talking so much, about there's civic, so much I mean, anger out oh, there. Sorry, there's so much anger out there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I have conversations with people at the grocery store and the gas station, and they got the anger and they got half the conversation there and half the analysis, but then the second half, the what is to be done well, half always falls it's apart. It's about, look, there's polarization and there's common ground. And, and Reverend Billy, I think, is the perfect example of the possibility of common ground. The fact is a lot of people on the so-called left are deeply distrustful, even worse, uh, disrespectful of people on the religious right. But the reality is there are a lot of people on the religious right who are angry at materialism, don't like shopping, think it's destroying their kids' souls. There are a lot of people on the right who think that God gave us a stewardship of the earth, you know, which needs to be exercised and therefore capable of being green. There are a lot of people on the Christian right who are egalitarians, because the Bible is about the brotherhood of man, on other issues, on culture, on abortion, and so on. We disagree deeply, but there's a lot of common ground. And part of a politics of populism that isn't right-wing or left-wing populism is a populism of common ground. Martin Luther King said, right before he was shot, actually, interestingly, he said, if poor whites and poor blacks ever figured out what they had in common, how we could change this country. You know, but they, they were seeing through race, the lens of race, they were seeing what separated them instead of through economics, seeing what joined them. So finding common ground is part of what a good political movement is about. And that's why Obama was kind of extraordinary because he was getting, you know, he was getting young white people, he was getting Puerto Ricans, he was getting Catholics, he was even getting some working class, quote, rednecks who were sick and tired of, you know, big corporate America in the Bush years. So for a while, he brought a lot of people together. Now he's having a tough time now because the people who suffered by an America united around him are doing their damnedest to polarize it again and get people at each other's throats hating one another again. But that politics is very important and it's a politics we see whenever we see effective civic and political leadership. That's right, and we're lucky enough in this room tonight to be a relatively diverse group of people. We live in New York City and work with a diverse group of people. What does that actually mean, and what does it look like, and how do we foster that all the time? It's, it's hard work, actually, integrating uh, people, integrating different kinds of people across class and race and with different skill sets and education levels, but it is imperative now, and it is uncomfortable for many to do that. It's uncomfortable for me sometimes, um, but it, it is necessary now to do that. And we've been at evangelical uh, conferences, showing our movie, talking to he rooms much bigger than this, full of uh, right-wing evangelical Christians. Now, I can assure you I was 
terrified in a way, you know, of what was happening to me. But um, and so were they. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, the radical, the radical promise of this country came from people talking to each other like that. And we have that in us. That history is not so distant from where we are now. Amen. The lady here in the fourth row back in the middle, she had a hand up earlier. The white shirt. There you in go. In the white shirt. Hallelujah. Here's the <laughs> <laughs> Price is right. I was born in Nebraska, so there's lots of hallelujah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I, admit, I appreciate what you said about uh, the public space, because uh, I grew up in small towns, and Saturday night was a magical time. Mm -hmm. Even though we had uh, tough times in our family, Saturday night was magical to go to town. And I want to share that I live in North Hollywood, and I used to go by this corner where uh, this strip mall uh, was all out of business. And I kept thinking, gee, that'd be a great place for a park. And I never did anything about it. And then about three years ago in my neighborhood, a lady came and she was, uh, she was uh, taking her kids. They were at the parking lot at the shul. And she says, you know, you have no parks in this neighborhood. And I was shamed. And so I just want to say that. I want to encourage everybody here tonight that if there's an action, you can take to take it. And then I want to say about the buying Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> and then I want to say I, too, tried to find some clothes. I tried to go someplace reasonably priced to find something that wasn't from China because I needed article of clothing. Could not find it. And the last thing I want to ask Mr. Barber here is that, because you talked about network TV, and uh, Barbara Walters is going to interview Glenn Beck. And I, I am very upset about this business, as we all rightly should be, about this threatening of the assassination of President Obama. And I don't consider it uh, lighthearted. Mm -hmm. I don't consider it uh, just disagreement of opinion. I consider this absolute racist hatred. And so I just want to ask you if you think, in your opinion, I'm being whatever, to want to, to want to, because we got Lou Dobbs off the air. Hallelujah. We're running for <laughs> Hallelujah. president. Hallelujah. You're going to get him as your next Republican yeah, president. Yeah, that's right. God forbid. Okay. But anyway. Yeah, okay. Let, let's let's uh, answer that, if you will, Ben. Well, yes. I mean, the great uh, danger, obviously, is there is a lot of racist hatred. There's a lot of class hatred. There's a lot of hatred of every kind afoot. And one of the things we've known historically is that there are a lot of people in the media who quietly legitimize the nutcases who do the real assassinations, you know, that, that happens when there's the kind of quiet talk that says, you know, if only so-and-so was dead, and that is very dangerous. And there, we hear that kind of talk around, and I agree with you, that's very dangerous. I mean, one of the, I, I pray that our country is in a place where even were a black president to be assassinated, we, we could now elect another. You know, that is to say, it's no longer, there's one, and if he gets it, that's the end of it. I think we've proven that that particular part of our history we have now put behind us. So the assassins, as they always do, even were they to succeed, will fail. The other good news is that the Secret Service has its own professional reputation uh, to preserve, and they feel very, I know some people who work there, they feel very strongly that you know they don't want to see anything happen on this guy's watch. And so he is getting a kind of protection and level of protection. Uh, never mind what happened at the White House yeah, last, was, last week. <laughs> but you know who did that? That was, that was Bravo. <laughs> that was Bravo. Bravo got them in. They came with their media team and the Bravo team. You know, they came with their own television team and so on. So if I was an assassin, I'd think about how could I get Discovery Channel or Bravo to escort me into the White House, because that's probably the way to get in. Amen. Mm. Well, let's take one last question. The gentleman in the back there. and. Uh, We'll call it a night. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, for attacking the issue of commercialism and, and uh, consumerism, at least from a top-down level, what do you think about uh, scratching the GDP, gross domestic product, for the GPI, the uh, Genuine product, uh, Progress Indicator? Are you guys familiar with that? Yep. OK. Just a second. <laughs> Metrics are crucial. What we measure and what we call things are crucial. Right now, the gross national product is measured primarily by private economic gain. The so-called externalities, happiness, public goods, all those things are simply not measured. A metric 
that actually allowed us to measure how much things cost, for example, in terms of their cost on the environment, their cost of public happiness, and so on, would give us a very different pricing system than the one we have now. So that change in metrics is, is really important. Well, and system. I think that one of the most, va I mean, you asked about what a, a left-wing movement would look like. What, what any movement would look like at this point is a, a, a new set of values, a, a new ev evaluative system. And uh, one of the things I think we do most of is, is give people permission really to uh, believe what, what they already believe by reinforcing it, by saying, you know what, we hear anecdotally, because it's the only way we're going to hear this, the media is not going to tell us, we hear reports about people uh, starting up businesses every day. We uh, hear about people who've stopped shopping all over the country all the time. So um, we... All of us have to do that work. That is the media, right? Talking and listening. It's a really basic idea. And, and I think that's maybe how we can reinvent citizenship, is to uh, talk and listen a lot more. And, and those, those, those value systems will uh, uh, be amplified a little bit more, at least. Well, let me say one last word about hope, if I may, because I know sometimes when I talk, <laughs> people get a little depressed. They say, well, you're, you know, you're a good social scientist, but you're pretty depressing. We just stop talking now you know, so we can go back to trying to do something. I just want to remind you historically that democracy is always in trouble, it's always a struggle, and it always looks like it's not going to make it. Just two little thought experiments before you go home to think about in thinking about trying to defeat the markets, defeat commercialism, defeat consumerism. Imagine you live in, say, 1670 in England, right? There's a monarchy, a brutal monarchy, there's religious war, and somebody says, don't worry, in 1688 there's going to be a glorious revolution, and by the 18th century, there's going to be being as a real democracy. By the 19th century, most Brits will have the vote. You know, you say, you're crazy, impossible. How can you do it? The monarchy, the church run England. There's no room for resistance, and yet it happened. Another experiment, another date, 1937. You're living in France or Germany, and you're saying, oh my God, Europe is on the brink of another world war. Mm -hmm. Germany and France, who have been slaughtering mm -hmm. each other for 300 years, are about to go at it again. In addition, we're going to have a horrendous genocide of Jews and gypsies and others. And someone says, no, that, that's going to be tough. It's going to be a gigantic price to pay. But don't worry, 20, 30 years from now, you Germans and you French are going to have a common currency. You're going to cross each other's borders without passports. And there'll never again be another French German war because you're going to have a European citizenship. You know, you look at that person and say, you're out of your yeah. friggin' mind. No way it's going to happen. And yet in both of those cases, it was democracy that won and the pessimists who lost. All we have to do is con defeat consumerism. Surely we can yes. do that. We can do it. We can do it. <laughs> so, Reverend Billy, uh, do we have a benediction? Or? Hallelujah. We ask the God that isn't trying to sell us anything. We're going to leave the hammer forum now. We're going to walk out into the streets, assailed by the, the devil marketing. Give us the strength to resist and start a new kind of world. Amen? Yes, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Other. But no money down. And we're just gonna go out there to